Brighton Rock, which is, depending on, on how you are feeling, it's either um, an adaptation of Graham Greene's novel or a remake of the Boltings film from 1947 or a bit of both. The major change in the new version of Brighton Rock is that the action has been updated to put it in uh, Brighton during the clashes between mods and rockers of the 1960s. So um, Sam Riley, who was going to be on the programme last week, but if you remember... It was John Hurt for about 10 seconds. He was seconds. just pretending to be It was a strange right. thing, yeah. So he's a small-time hood pinky who begins the movie being involved in a brutal killing, which in which he is subsequently implicated by a photograph which is taken by a seaside snapper. Andre Risborough is the naive waitress who, because of this peculiar series of events, ends up being the person who has the ticket for the photograph, which is the incriminating piece of evidence. Therefore, the whole film essentially pivots on... Uh, a hideous uh, relationship which is that he being a dark-hearted character with this young boy's face has to essentially woo and marry this apparently innocent girl in order to prevent her from becoming the person who will implicate him and lead to his conviction here's a clip what did you tell her i told her i never seen for an hour before i don't think i should go back to snows no, of course you go back if you quit snows now it'll look bad Besides, Fred Ale died natural. You said he was mixed up with the mob. Come on. Come on. Stop blabbing your mouth off. If you keep blabbing your mouth off, I'll... These geezers will come after you. I'm trying to help you. Why can't you understand that? I do. If it weren't for you, I... I trust you, Pinkett, honestly. I do. So... The difficulty with any version of Brighton Rock is that because, you know, there's this, you know, well-accepted uh, both literary classic and uh, film classic, once you go anywhere near it, people automatically start to throw their arms and go, oh, you can't go anywhere near that classic, which I don't believe is the case at all. There is something that's an interesting idea about updating it to put it amidst the mods and rockers, essentially because of this. If you remember the, um, the, the the Attenborough version, in which the whole point was, and he was actually younger than Sam Riley anyway, but he looked sort of young and baby-faced and he looked like a boy, and yet inside he was this darkened, you know, already this darkened, there's a lot of Catholic guilt involved in it, but it's like his soul is aged and dark, even though from the outside he looks like a child. Actually, Sam Riley, who apparently is now six, seven years older than Attenborough was, does have that same very babyish thing. I mean, so, same... He sort of looks like Leonardo DiCaprio a lot through the movie. Actually, that's a very good comparison. He does. He has that same sense of looking boyish, despite the fact that he is... I think he's 30 now, isn't he, Sam Riley? I mean, he's, 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 one, of, yeah, he's one of those people... He's older than you think he is, and I thought he was terrific in control, and I, you know, I gave him Kermit Award for Best Actor for that. I thought it was a really wonderful performance, and it's a very good piece of casting because he does have that thing of having a young face, a clean face, a fresh face, and yet having with it the gravitas to pull off something you know which is older and of course when you move the action into the setting of the mods and rockers two things happen the first is that the, his character, dressed in a gangster suit and capable of hideous violence, somehow manages to blend in with the mods who are, you know, kids but dressed as, you know, smart. The whole point about, you know, mods was they dressed as successful, smart, suit-wearing guys who then also happened to be incredibly violent and have these confrontations on the beach. And there was, if you remember, you ever read Stanley Cohen's Folk Devils and Moral Panics, which is a sort of a, a very interesting book about... No? Folk Devils and, and Moral, moral Panics. Pan yeah. No, I'll add that to my list. It's a very interesting book about um, how the sort of birth of youth culture and teenage culture sort of provoked this schism whereby adults saw children as being something that was fundamentally being corrupted and he talks about mods and rockers and the idea of kids teenagers <clears throat> being looked at by their parents who couldn't quite understand whether they were teenagers Is anymore. it a Marxist analysis? No it's not no it's a sociological analysis but it's not a Marxist analysis but it's a, tr it's a really it's a very very important time but there is that idea that when the mods and rockers thing happened, there was this kind of national revulsion at the idea that young kids dressing as grown-ups with money to spend were going down to Brighton behaving in this sort of terrible animal way. And, of course, what happens, and moving the Brighton Rock story into the middle of that, is that a couple of key violent incidents happen against the backdrop of the mods and rockers fighting on the beach, which actually looks, for all the world, like somebody pulled in Quadrophenia. I mean, it's it's odd. I mean, it's literally like the, the set, the, the, the guys from Quadrophenia, including Phil Davis, ran from Quadrophenia, kept running, kept on going down and suddenly piled into the thing the next time found themselves running down a production of Brighton Rock and on one level that works as an interesting idea 
whether it then manages to sustain itself for the rest of the drama, which requires a, a sort of strange mixture of the characters knowing what's happening to them and yet not knowing, of the Catholicism being fundamentally important to the story of the, the sense of guilt, the sense of imminent damnation, because in the end, it is an incredibly dark story. I mean, it, it, that is what it is. It is very, very dark. And I think what's happened with the updating is that there are moments when it clicks and it works. And there is one particular scene in which there is a violent confrontation happening with the mods and rockers in the background, in which I thought, oh, that, actually, that's really good. That does work. But then there are other moments in which you think it's like, you know, sometimes when people do adaptations of Shakespeare and they take a famous Shakespeare play, but they put it on the moon, right? Or they take a famous Shakespeare play and they set it in a, uh, a, a you know, a, a steel factory in Sheffield. They, they move it somewhere and you go, oh, that's that's interesting because it means that works and that works and that works, but another bit of it doesn't. It only works with some of the elements. Well, I felt very much like that with Brighton Rock. There are certain parts of the updating that did feel a little bit cronky, that did feel a little bit creaky, did feel like the thing was being pushed in two different directions, but there are about four or five central pieces in which the ideas really came together. In the end, I think it is more of an idea than it is a success. I don't think it's a film that's going to have the sort of the longevity of the of, it, of its predecessor, but there are individual bits in it in which that idea works. And if, like me, you're interested in that folk devils and moral panics thing, which I understand not everybody is, those chime rather better. Right. So, would it be quite good to read that book before I go and see it again? Then um, you've seen the original film oh, many years ago. Well, you could read. I mean, I, no, I mean, I would, Sorry, I'm not going to. But I'm no, I would. Just... I would say. I mean, it's worth going to see because it's an interesting idea. There are points in it when the interesting idea works, and there are other points in it in which it in which they it just doesn't.